Thank you and welcome. Uh, it's uh, truly an honor to be standing in front of you and representing uh, Northwest National Council on Family Relations. Uh, I want to start with a question uh, and just raise your hand if, if this, I'm going to ask two questions. If this, these questions apply to you, oh, is that started? It's red. Perfect. It's red. Circle, red circle. Red circle. We're good. We're okay. Uh, how many in the room uh, have been directly uh, affected, allow me to finish the question, directly affected by a member of your own family, uh, by someone who's been diagnosed with a substance use disorder, better known as addiction, I'll talk about the terms that I'm going to use, substance use disorder, and or someone who's found a pathway to recovery. Raise your hand if you're willing to do that. Okay? That's okay. They don't, they don't have to be. If they, yes. And then keep your hand up. And then the second part, uh, I won't have your hands up too long, just about an hour. Uh, <laughs> Tell me, raise your hand if you know, if you've had a friend or an extended family member, or you know of a family who have been affected by a substance use disorder and or found a pathway to recovery. I have a captive audience. Look around. We're all touched by this uh, highly important issue of substance use disorders in our society. And uh, I won't spend a lot of time talking about... Um, our current epidemic, which you don't have to go far to read about it, um, but the um, opi opioid epidemic, which uh, a, a someone who has a, develops a substance use disorder then turns to heroin. Um, we are in a crisis of epic proportions as I speak. Um, but what I want to do today is give a history lesson. Because I think when you learn about the history of how our society, uh, government agencies, public private treatment agencies, has historically coped with, treated, created policies and laws in relation to substance use disorders, you can have a better understanding of why we are in the situation we are in the year 2018 with all of the data research and knowledge we have about substance use disorders. So I want to tell you a story to speak to um, what would happen if somebody uh, needed access to treatment. Uh, you, uh, this is a, a, a fictional story, but it's very real. It happens every day. Right here in little old Ellensburg, in the Puget Sound area, or any other city across our nation. Someone, uh, husband, wife, they have a couple kids, they get in an auto accident. It can happen. Everyone lives, but uh, mom or dad, you pick, they end up in the hospital, and they have to have pretty major surgery to repair the damage from the auto accident. Surgery successful, goes well, modern medicine's great. When they leave the hospital, actually it starts while they're in the hospital, they're prescribed pain medication. Very normal. You would want that to happen. They're likely going to be prescribed an opioid, uh, narcotic medication. And for a lot of people, this won't become an issue. But for too many people, this is what's going to happen. They go home, they're discharged from the hospital, the doctor gives them a prescription so that they can manage that pain. Mind you, this is any family. Socioeconomic status does not matter. Ethnicity doesn't matter. Male or female, it doesn't matter. But for this example, it's a family. Both individuals work. They have careers. Kids are in school. Everything's fine. There's no real indicator of, of how this could lead to a substance use disorder. They go home. Uh, the person who has the surgery, male or female, they're out of work for months because of the injury and the healing time it's going to take. And during that time, they develop a dependency on the opioid medication. When a lot of people would slowly taper off, they develop a dependency and they take more than what's prescribed. If it's a good doctor, and I put emphasize, a doctor that has training in this area, they will recognize it and they'll go, no, 
I need to wean you off. Why don't you come in? Let's talk about it. And let me help you get off. But what I'm going to tell you is that doesn't happen in many cases. Is they just get cut off of a highly powerful narcotic medication that they've now become dependent on. So for purposes of time, and so I have enough time to cover everything I want to cover, they develop this dependency. They don't go back to work. They uh, aren't able to get the, the uh, drug they need at this point through uh, legal means, so they find it. And right here in Ellensburg, you could find uh, pills being sold on the black market illegally, probably if you really wanted to in less than an hour. You can find them probably even quicker in bigger metropolitan areas, so that's what they do. They start having problems in their family. The husband or wife, whoever it is, uh, they start recognizing the issue, they try to address it, but they don't have knowledge of the things that you're going to learn about. They don't know what to do. Um, and to save the children from all of the chaos, they, the, the marriage breaks up. That person moves out, whoever they move in with, wherever they go, doesn't matter. They, they need that drug. They've never heard of treatment. They've never heard of this term called recovery. They had no idea this was going to happen to them. Mind you, six months prior, they were working, everything was fine. And so then they do what a lot of people do who are in active addiction with active substance use disorders, is they start stealing to get their drug, to feed the addiction. And what happens then is they start engaging with law enforcement, with the criminal justice system. Now, once you just key in on what I'm saying, you break a law, you're probably going to have contact with the law enforcement officer. That law enforcement officer is going to do their job. If it's a, 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 a felony crime, you're going to jail, and that's what's going to happen. And so what starts is this cycle. And in many cases, nobody, they might recognize that there's an issue with drugs, but it doesn't get addressed. So the person starts engaging in criminal activity, they're estranged from their family, but at some point along the way, they go, I need some help. They recognize it. Someone with some education says, hey, you need treatment. You need to get help for this. The family member says, I've been researching, I've been reading. Let's, let's get you some help. Now, mind you, they don't have a job anymore. They lost their insurance. So they go down to any treatment center, and they say, I need help. And this is what's going to happen right here in Kittitas County and in definitely larger metropolitan areas where their systems are overwhelmed. They're going to be asked to fill out a bunch of paperwork. They're hopefully going to get a diagnosis that would allow them to go to treatment. But what's going to happen is they're going to get put on a wait list. Because public funding, this person needs public funding publicly funded treatment, they don't have insurance, so they can't go to uh, a place where they could get instant access if they had cash money or insurance. They get put on a wait list, 30, 60, 90 days. And they get told, we'll call you and we'll let you know. What's that person going to do? They're going to go back to use, almost immediately. <coughs> they go back to the behavior, the criminal behavior, to feed their addiction. I use the word magic, but here's what happens. They get instant access to services. Instant access to law enforcement and a jail cell. And we pay for this repeatedly over and over again to the tune of the statistic I'll talk about with the drug war of over a trillion dollars pumped toward the legal system to address this person's medical issue. And that's what we're dealing with right now in the year 2018. And I paint a bleak picture, but I'm, and I will talk about some positive things that are happening and have happened along the way. But that's what is happening right now in the year 2018, is someone who needs access to treatment can't get it in many cases, but they get instant access to the legal system via a police officer, handcuffs, and a jail. And we pay 50 plus thousand dollars a year to house a person in a jail cell or a prison. But the funding isn't there to spend just half that money on what would really solve the issue. Everyone following me? 
So, I wanted to start with that story and then tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I teach here at Central Washington University. Um, I teach in a completely different area. Uh, my undergraduate and graduate work is all in family studies. But I teach in an IT department. <coughs> People are usually like, what? what are you talking about? But I teach on our administrative management side. I teach business management classes, communication, the soft skills, this stuff. I love what I do. I'm very passionate about working with students, helping them to achieve their goals. But the reason I'm in front of you today is because of my work as a, an advocate in the community, helping to find ways for families to find an effective pathway for a person in their family to get to recovery and stay in recovery. Uh, my most recent project is a member of a task force with the Ellensburg School District. We literally, our grant writer just clicked send yesterday on a federal grant, and I'm excited, Whew. that would create a recovery high school in Ellensburg as a part of the Ellensburg School District. So that's my current project. I've also worked with Central on recovery initiatives here. Um, it is a passion area of, of mine. So what are we going to cover? We're going to talk about um, how the drug war began. Um, we're going to talk about uh, um, work that happened before the drug war began, um, then the drug war, and then we're going to talk about things that have been happening in the last 10 to 15 years, where we've seen some positive movement toward these efforts that you can see on the screen that were happening 40s and in the 40s and 60s toward a medical approach to substance use disorders um, that is encouraging. Uh, so that's the plan, and my hope is to stay on task, to not to go over time, because I want to have time for you guys to answer questions. Um, so if you have questions along the way, feel free to raise your hands, but I will have an opportunity for everyone to ask questions um, at the end. So, in the early days of the work in this arena of substance use disorder, at a federal level, at a policy level, we had a, a pioneer in the arena of recovery advocacy, and her name was Marty Mann. And uh, she was... Uh, a friend of, how many of you heard of the program Alcoholics Anonymous? Yes, so that, that program began in the, in the 30s, and she was a friend of the founder of Alcoholics Anonymous. His name was Bill Wilson. And um, she really saw a need for uh, this to be treated as a medical issue. And so she was the founder of the National Council on Alcoholism and Drug Dependency. Um, along with her and a senator at the time, Senator Harold Hughes, who was a person in recovery, he was one of the first prominent people in society to publicly say, I'm an alcoholic, but I'm in recovery, and we need to do things at a, at a government level, on a federal policy level, to help others. And there was, some, there was some really great things happening. And I encourage you to do more research on this so you can learn all of the details. We don't have enough time in this hour to cover everything, but it was the first time during this period with the work of, of Marty Mann and, and Senator Harold Hughes where you had prominent figures going in front of Congress and lobbying, in effect, for change, for creation of of uh, departments underneath the Department of Health and Human Services, if that was its name at the time, but looking at this issue of alcoholism and drug addiction and finding ways to help people recover. And it was really an exciting time. This is also key, too. Uh, it was in 1952 that the American Medical Association officially gave alcoholism a medical diagnosis, and that was a shift. It went from being what was viewed as a moral failing, if you had issues with drugs or alcohol, to an actually medically diagnosable issue. And that was important because then insurance companies, and it took a while, they almost had to allow for treatment. The federal government also, because you had the American Medical Association saying, no, this is real. 
It's not just because someone has a lack of willpower. It's not because someone doesn't go to the right church or doesn't have the right family. It's a medical condition. So that was powerful. But a shift happened. And it was in uh, 1969, the Nixon administration. Uh, a little, little backstory here. Many of you know during this period the civil rights movement was in full swing. A lot of positive change was happening. The, but there was a lot of pushback. Women's rights was gaining a lot of steam. But as you know from history, there was a lot of pushback. And there are some scholars who say that the drug war that was declared was actually pushback on the civil rights movement. This was his all but too infamous declaration. Come to join me here. Won't you be seated, please, ladies and gentlemen? Come on, Dr. Jaffe. Mr. Crow, Mr. Ryan. Sure. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to summarize for you the meeting that I have just had with the bipartisan leaders, which began at 8 o'clock and was completed two hours later. I began the meeting by making this statement, which I think needs to be made to the nation. America's public enemy number one in the United States is drug abuse. In order to fight and defeat this enemy, it is necessary to wage a new all-out offensive. I have asked the Congress to provide the legislative authority and the funds to fuel this kind of an offensive. What does it sound like he's talking about? What it sounds like he's talking about is going to war. And that was the advent of the drug war that we have been waging since that time in 1969. It was directly following that period that agencies were created. Everyone knows DEA. The DEA was created after this announcement and policies and, and uh, laws that were passed, and their whole goal was to wage this war against drugs. But here's the reality, and don't believe me, look up the statistics on this, is that it's never been a war on drugs. It's always been a war on people. It's always been a war on humans. Not just any humans, but the main target for the war on drugs was on low-income African Americans across our nation. We know now, through statistics and studies, that it's not just low-income black people who do drugs. It's not just low-income black people who have problems with alcohol. But that was the target of the drug war. And so you saw a complete shift in this work that had started happening here to the work that started happening here. That was a pivotal shift in history. And, and I'll, I'll, be, uh, I'll admit that there was still some movement toward access, but um, for the population that the drug war was targeted to, not for them. So it was a really critical point. And to this day, over a trillion dollars Probably by now, because this is old and I've been saying it for several years, probably a trillion and a half has been spent on the war on drugs with zero positive effect. And what does that mean? The whole goal of the war on drugs was to stop the flow of drugs into society. It hasn't done that. So it's had zero effect, but it continues to be fought. Countless families. Thousands of families uh, have suffered. The, the families I described, low-income uh, African-American families suffered greatly because what started to happen is uh, uh, fathers were sentenced to long-term jail and prison sentences for, this is key, low-level, non-violent, drug-related crime. If they had access to treatment and recovery, the crimes go away. But this is what started happening. It continued. And the 80s marked a massive, massive 
increase in the drug war and its effects on our society as a whole. But still, low income, primarily African American communities. How many of you heard of the, the, the crack epidemic of the 80s? This, this is important to understand about this, and I've done the research, and, and I was an adult during this period, and I remember, is that um, it was uh, uh, leaders who came on TV, and, and, and it was an epidemic, it was, it was pretty serious. But who were the targets of the drug war? Again, low-level, non-violent people who were using crack cocaine. And crack cocaine is cocaine cooked in, in rocks. This began these really harsh, Congress passed these really harsh, draconian laws that were specifically targeted toward trying to have an effect to stem the tide of crack. And so here's how it took place. If you had a rock of cocaine, which is a very, very small amount of cocaine itself, if you had a rock, or God forbid, you had three, four, or five rocks in individual baggies, and you went in front of a judge, you were prosecuted, found guilty, and you went in front of a judge, mandatory sentencing meant that judge's hands were tied. Many people were sentenced to nearly the life sentences for that small amount of crack cocaine. Okay. And many dealers who are dealing this, they're feeding their own substance use disorder. So this is what you saw take place. But yet, if you had a baggie, an ounce of powder cocaine, and access to pay for an attorney, those mandatory sentence, sentence laws didn't apply to you. So you really started seeing a massive disparity in who was going to prison for a long time and who wasn't. And it was during this period where you saw these massive, Massive increases. You can see right here the massive spike in about 88, 89. And how many of you heard the term mass incarceration? This is where it began. And guess who was getting locked up? Guess who was going to jail for long periods of time? We couldn't build prisons fast enough. Think of the families, right? A person who needs treatment, but they got... A prison sentence. So this is also where uh, absent fathers started happening in low-income ethnic communities where the crack epidemic was happening. But the reality is, and we know now, we have facts, we have the studies to show that they weren't the only ones smoking crack cocaine. It was happening in every community. But what we saw on the news and what our, our president at the time even did is he got on national TV and talked about where it was happening. And we were going to continue to wage the war. I will say that there was some funding starting to be shifted to treatment and recovery resources. But it paled in comparison to the amount of money that was being sent to law enforcement agencies across governments, across states, to continue to fight this war on drugs, which was really a war on humans. And so, again, if, if there was any mindset during this period of we need to treat this as, as a healthcare approach, it was another period where that just paled in comparison to we were treating it as a, a criminal justice issue. And so we, we couldn't build prisons fast enough. And we went into the, uh, the 90s, Wait, I want to make sure. Yep, I told you that. Good. We went into the uh, 90s, and how many of you uh, know what the drug epidemic of the 90s was? Anyone? Because it's, it's just a different drug. It was meth, methamphetamines. Not a good claim to fame, but Washington State, Pierce County, was actually the meth capital of the world in the mid-90s. Now, here's, here's what happened, and this is where uh, another shift happened, 
and the drug war, which had primarily affected low-income, primarily African-American communities the most, guess what? Meth was a white man's drug. Most African-Americans didn't want anything to do with meth. It was a white man's drug. It was, it was very, very strong, toxic speed. But this is what started happening. Number one, there were many people that were saying, by this point, the drug war is not working. We are not going to arrest our way out of a drug problem. <coughs> and for the first time ever, we had leaders in law enforcement, sheriffs, police chiefs, prosecutors, waving the white flag going, we can't keep doing this. We are not going to arrest our way out of the problem. Because they saw it firsthand that if you just arrest someone, put handcuffs on, send them to jail, don't give them any treatment, don't give them any resources, even if they do get treatment, for the long term, they're going to go back to use, go back to the same behavior. They were seeing it day in and day out. Medical professionals, emergency rooms. They've been waving the right white flag for a long time. So you started to see a shift. To speak to, uh, uh, and, and I have a theory, is why you started to see the shift in some people's eyes, is because it started affecting more middle class affluent families out front. And so all of a sudden, maybe we need to start doing things different. So this was when you started seeing drug courts. How many of you heard of drug court? Okay. Drug courts came in because prosecutors were going, we're overwhelmed. Mid-90s, late 90s, Pierce County, King County, oh my gosh. The court system was completely overwhelmed because you had these really harsh laws. If you had an empty baggie and it just had a film of methamphetamines in it, that's a felony charge. Guess what? There were a lot of them, right? And so prosecutors were like, we got to do something different. So you started to see some communication between treatment providers, medical professionals, law enforcement officials saying, okay, we, we got to try to do something different. Drug courts came into play. And what the drug court process is in place to do is to help someone find a path to change their life. You get a felony drug charge. It's a low-level, non-violent charge. We're not talking about rapists, murderers, or anything like that. We're talking about, you know, you had meth on you. Uh, I didn't mean to say it in your direction, but uh, you, you had meth on you and you were, you were stealing, right? Okay, that meth possession was a felony charge, and so what they would say is, the judge, the judge's hands. They started. We started seeing a shift in, in laws and policy. The draconian laws started falling away. Hmm. Wonder why? Interesting. But they did. So good. And judges started having some leeway. So judges were assigned to what are called judge drug courts, and that's all they did. Prosecutors. They picked them special. They had empathy. They had some understanding. And if you you sign up for drug courts. For two years, let's say that's the period, usually one to two years, you go to treatment, we'll pay for the treatment, um, we'll help you find a job, we'll help you do so, we'll help you turn your life around. And they saw great success. Drug courts, we have drug courts uh, in Kittitas County, there's drug courts across the country. They, they ramped up really fast, like the drug war ramped up. People in, 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 in uh, Congress and state and, and local agencies started going, wow, this maybe is a, a good thing to do. But this was huge in that period, is, is having law enforcement agencies at a federal, uh, state, and local level going, we can't keep doing this. It's not going to work. And so you started seeing a shift back to the period of the 40s and 60s. Recovery advocates started having a voice again. And so the tide started to change. And since that time, it's been slowly moving forward in, in a mostly positive way. Okay. So toward a healthcare approach, and again, I like to say this a few times when I do this presentation, is substance use disorders are a healthcare issue. They're not a criminal justice issue. 
we've been trying to treat them from a criminal justice standpoint for years through the drug war and, and, and tax dollars, over a trillion tax dollars spent. But what we've learned and what we now have buy-in from most people in law enforcement, in the medical field, policymakers, lawmakers, social service agencies, they've been saying it for years, is that we need to provide access to treatment and now, in the last few years, recovery support. So that example that I gave you early uh, about the individual who needs treatment and they have to wait 30, 60, 90 days. My son works in the field. He works on an all-male inpatient treatment center. Um, and he deals with this on a daily basis. If you get the treatment, when you get the bed, a bed date for treatment, and you go, you're going to be there max, in most cases, 21 to 30 days. Is that long enough? No. In many cases, it's not, because just think about it. Someone who, who at some point in their life was a, a goal-driven, productive citizen. They have the scenario I described, and they end up in active use for two, three, four years. Just giving them a 21 or 30-day subacute episode in a treatment center isn't enough. So we're starting to see more funding and more support for support after treatment. Uh, helping them engage with mental health professionals to deal with what's called co-occurring disorders, depression, anxiety, helping them uh, get back to school or get back into the workforce with uh, job retraining. You're starting to see a, a shift in those areas. So by the end of the 90s and to this day, the shift has been happening to repair years-long damage in our society to many families, thousands, countless families, <coughs> to start looking at this from a healthcare approach. In the last 10 years, we've started to see prominent figures come forward. Uh, there's a, uh, a gentleman I follow, his name's Tom Coderre. He works in the Massachusetts, I'm gonna struggle saying the state's name, Massachusetts, close. He was in the uh, state senate there. He uh, started having issues with substance use disorders, um, became a full-blown addiction. He was on the news um, because that's what we see, right? We see people that are having the issues on the news. And then he was able to find a pathway to recovery through another person who had been in long-term recovery, and he had became an advocate in the field. And what he's been able to do is come right out in front, Tom Coderre, get into recovery, find support, and now go back to Congress in his state and become a lawmaker again and become a game changer in changing policy. Uh, there are other individuals who are making amazing uh, headway in the recovery advocacy movement. A gentleman named Chris Herron, former NBA star. He was all over the news with active addiction and all the damage. He's been able to find pathways to recovery, and now he has a whole foundation, and their whole purpose is to change the public perception of substance use disorders and help people find pathways to recovery. He speaks at high schools, colleges across the nation. We've had other individuals, uh, young people in recovery. This is one of my passion areas. Uh, there's a thing now, it's becoming normalized uh, almost every day, quicker and faster and faster, and it's called collegiate recovery programs. And here's, here's a beautiful thing where uh, there's uh, uh, treatment providers on college campuses. Because it used to be, and there's still some school of thought that, man, you need to stop going to school and you need to just focus on you know, getting treatment and getting into recovery, and now what we know is, no, let's, let's engage them in treatment services, help them get into early recovery, support them, mentor them, keep them in school. Magic. It's beautiful. So we, we're seeing those things happen. Uh, recovery high schools. Right here in Washington State, as part of the Seattle School District, I visited uh, the Seattle Recovery High School as part of their alternative high school program a couple times, and it's an amazingly successful program. Not just for the students, but for the families. Because uh, part of the recovery high school model, the one we just submitted for a federal grant, 
is we have a major piece in there on engaging with the families, especially with young people. Because I've been a drug and alcohol counselor working with youth, and, and, and I help them to find a path to recovery, and then if every day I'm sending them home to a highly dysfunctional, maybe parents who have substance use disorders, and we're not addressing that, their chances of success are very small. So these new models of, of engaging with individuals and their families is proving to be very successful. So policies on a federal level uh, in the last administration and even the administration before that uh, started to drastically change. For the first time ever, if you can imagine that, first time ever during the Obama administration, the Surgeon General released and this is big in the medical community, the first study and report on addiction in America. And why is that important? Because that affects policy. That affects law. And it was a highly, highly publicized and talked about report. Uh, in 2015, I'm almost done, and I want to open it up for questions. Uh, I'm going to share some other uh, research tools for you to look at on your own, and then I'll open it up for questions. Uh, in 2015, first time ever, uh, thousands, I myself included, converged on Washington, D.C. for uh, a rally showing thousands of people who had found a pathway to recovery and were living amazing lives. Because what we know is we have many people, we have over 23 million people, it's even higher now, that's getting old, I need to find out exactly, in long-term recovery. But with the stigmatization of addiction, substance use disorders, and even recovery, what tends to happen is we hear about people when they're in active addiction, but they fall off the radar once they get into recovery. And what a lot of the recovery advocates that have started on grassroots level have started to say is, no, we need to speak loudly about the power of a person in recovery. And so we went to Washington, D.C., and we didn't just do the rally, we went on Capitol Hill. This was in 2015 when they were passing the mental health parity law, and it passed, large in part because people in recovery went to Capitol Hill and said, no, we're real. We're a constituency that votes. And so that's helped affect policy on a, a, state, a local, state, and federal level. So we're seeing uh, policy start to change. It's unfortunate, uh, in the current administration, um, the drug war is being ramped up again. And it's unfortunate. There has been talk about the, uh, President Trump came on national news and he talked about the opioid epidemic, which is of epic proportions. Epic. And he talked about, he declared an emergency, but there's no funding behind that. Not a dollar has gone with it. And we've been waiting for the federal government and the administration to fund access to treatment and recovery supports. And this is the sad truth about what's happening right now, just to speak quickly to the opioid epidemic, is that we have the equivalent right now of a plane with upwards of 250 people dropping out of the sky on a daily basis, and everyone on board perishing. That's not just myth, that's a fact. In 2016, we're waiting for the 2017 numbers to come out. In 2016, in the United States of America, 64,000 plus people died of overdoses. Whether you believe addiction is a medical condition or a moral failing, that number is staggering. We have to do something. And so, as a recovery advocate myself, I still push forward for policy changes on a local level where I can. I work with people who are working at a state level and national level. I believe that change can happen. On the screen, I have some links for you, and it's on the handout. I encourage you to, to check some of the research out. Uh, William White, he's been doing research in the recovery arena for 50 years. So a lot of what I talked about, he has many research papers. He's done tons of research, a great resource. Uh, uh, Dr. Laudette, uh, for my own master's program, 
uh, I used a lot of her information in my own uh, research and project to create a template for a recovery community on campus. She's been doing research in the arena of addiction and recovery and families for many years, a great resource. Dr. Myers, he created what's called the craft method, method for uh, access pathways to treatment and recovery. And his method is starting to be used more and more. And what his method says is you can't just treat the individual. You have to treat the whole family. And I read it first in 2011 when I was doing my master's program, and I was just, my eyes came wide open because it makes sense. Family systems. The addiction doesn't just affect the individual, it affects everyone. So sometimes, and this is what he talks about, you start treating the family before you even talk to the person with the substance use disorder. They might be off the radar. So, great information there. Uh, uh, Senator Kennedy, former lawmaker, he's been on the forefront of recovery advocacy for years. He was uh, part of that uh, parity act uh, uh, to get it passed and, and the whole Kennedy family, but as lawmakers, they've done a lot of work to uh, push our movement forward. I say this young man because Greg Williams, I, I don't think he's 30, 32 years old, but he, he has been one of the grassroots founding members of this recovery movement in the last five to ten years. Uh, I'm going to share with you a small clip from a film, and uh, I don't know if I, did I write it on that? The Anonymous People? Yeah. Good. Watch that film. Have anyone seen it? Oh, good. Yeah, yeah I know you have. <laughs> Amazing film. And it opened my eyes. And it talks about what I just talked about, but in greater detail. And um, gives some great information. So those are some of the uh, resources. Uh, the film, The Anonymous People. Generation Found was created by uh, Greg Williams and his team. And what Generation Found does, oh man, it's, I get so excited. It's actually, oh yeah, um, it's actually what uh, encouraged me, gave me the information for when uh, uh, the Ellensburg School District called me, because I've done work with the Alternative High School here in Ellensburg, Excel, and, and uh, a person I work with, she called me, she knows I've done research in this area, she says, hey, we're, we're thinking about revamping the alternative high school program. It's just not, you know, she says, what do you think we should do? True story, first words out of my mouth. Recovery high school. It's pretty exciting. Generation Found uh, follows one of the very first recovery high schools in Houston. Amazing, amazing program. Uh, you can watch another documentary on the drug war. It's called American Drug War, The Last White Hope. Uh, uh, troubling, but very, uh, 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 informing. Uh, a couple websites, the National Council on Drug and Alcohol Dependency, which has just merged with a recovery advocacy group facing addiction, Faces and Voices of Recovery, and I'm Not Anonymous. These two sites have been grassroots uh, recovery advocacy groups in helping people in recovery to come out of silence, to speak loudly about yeah, I used to have an issue with substances, but I don't anymore, and here's how I got there. My name's David Douglas, and I'm a person in long-term recovery. At 29 years old, I was on the streets. That's a true story. But because of access to recovery, treatment, family support, institutional support along the way, I have an amazing life today. And that's what these... Uh, agencies and recovery advocacy groups encourage others to do. So in closing, I'll show you a short clip so to hopefully encourage you to watch it yourself. This is a, a preview of the anonymous people. Whether we want to admit this or not, this is our black plague. There's 25 million people that suffer from this illness. We have an epidemic. It's a national crisis that untreated addiction cost our economy over $550 billion last year. It's disgraceful that we have done so little about it thus far. Once you're an addict, you're that thing that they have to have. So many people think of addicts as homeless people living under bridges. The media 
is difficult for us to battle against because the negative news about addiction is dramatic. You know what we in the media do? We wink, wink it. We snoop dog it. Hey, oh yeah, they're stoned. That's fine. If everyone thinks of alcoholism and addiction as a negative thing, no one's going to want to go get help. As a culture, we are still very rooted in just say no. Drugs are menacing our society. We're going to try to incarcerate our way out of the addiction problem. Our jails are full of addicts and alcoholics. They're all pulled up in one spot. When you're caught, you will do time. Recovery is what you need, not prison. Hello? Alcoholism has too long been a taboo subject. The shame and secrecy are just as deadly as the disease itself. Our numbers are unbelievably strong, but yet we have no voice. We know about every issue out there, but people don't know how important the issue of recovery is. As a person in long-term recovery from an illness that has no cure, but an illness that has a solution. If we could ever tap those 20 million people in long-term recovery, you change this overnight. Now it's my turn to teach you that recovery works. History's on our side. History will show one day who and what we are. So I say we make history. Voices are out there. We have to find and open the hearts. And I think those hearts are one of you. I refuse to feel ashamed of who I am. I most certainly will not be embarrassed that I'm an addict. I'm going to tell whoever I damn well want to. There's a lot of us. Everyone knows somebody. It was this film when I uh, watched it that helped me to come out of the shadows. I never used to talk about being a person in recovery. I never used to talk about uh, uh, the reality of, of my past and, and the changes that I had made. And it was this film, and, and when I heard, imagine if the 23 plus million people in recovery started talking about it and started voting and started going to Washington, D.C. and knocking on policymakers' door. Imagine, just like he says, if we could change it overnight. I'm open to any questions you have about any information I provide. I, I provided. I highly encourage you, as future professionals or current professionals, to learn more about this highly important issue. Questions, sir. Uh, so one interesting thing to me about drug courts is it's sort of an interdisciplinary approach. It's, yes, it's <coughs> medically driven but with legal enforcement mechanisms. So. You talked a lot about having access to treatment. My question is, um, do you envision access alone as sufficient, or will there always need to be some legal ability to compel people to treat? Good question. Thank you for the question, Schaefer. Um, and my belief is that we've got to move away from the punitive-based model of treatment. And while drug courts are, I think, a good thing, and many drug courts are even changing the name they call them because there's a lot of stigmatization. If you're in recovery, if you've been in recovery for six months or a year, which you could be, you're still having to say, well, I have to go to drug court. They're calling them therapy courts. They're calling them different positive names. But my, my gut tells me and my research based on the drug war is we need to shift this completely away from the criminal justice approach and 100% toward a healthcare approach. We would never think of criminalizing other medical issues, would we? But this is the one issue that we have criminalized. I hope that answers your question. Great question. Um, yes? Um, I just have a question. Like so I know like high schools, they tend to do, when they talk about drugs, they're always like, just say no. So yeah. what do you think is an effective way to explain to high schoolers how they should approach a situation when they are offered drugs? Yeah. Great question. And uh, high schools, the just say no of Nancy Reagan, that whole um, uh, the D.A.R.E. program, now the research show shows that the, the scared straight method or the just say no, it doesn't work. What works 
is prevention through education. Just giving them the information, not doing the, the parent or teacher, don't do drugs, just say no. We know that doesn't work. What does work is education. Giving them the information and teaching healthy behaviors. Yes. 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 Ooh, that's a good question. I don't know. Oh, 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 the one we're trying to open. Oh my gosh, it's... The curriculum, they're there to graduate high school. So the curriculum itself doesn't really change. It's more flexible in how they, they complete it. That's all alternative high schools. That doesn't change. Here's what changes. We will have on-site uh, family uh, counselors. I forget the title we're calling them. That, that person's there all the time for that student to go into their office at any time and say, hey, maybe could you reach out to my mom or we're having problems with food or rent or whatever, so they're, they're a resource. Mental health counselors on site to help them. Uh, life skills is an added curriculum piece. Uh, alternative peer groups, student-led recovery groups, not where they're going to a dark church basement with a bunch of old people, their own groups, and they get a design. It's what they want it to be. Does that help? Yeah. Yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> We're just. Uh, yes. Thank you. Sir. I, I appreciated the history uh, that you uh, gave at the beginning, and also the allusion to some hidden agendas. Mm -hmm. um, what, what's your thought on uh, the role of? major pharmaceuticals uh, yeah. uh, and the opioid crisis in, in lieu of even some of the news in the last couple of days. So. Yep. Um, and, I, and I didn't touch on any of the, the really uh, specifics of the opioid epidemics, but we've got some serious issues with the pharmaceutical industry. And we know, uh, we were talking earlier, you were in Florida. Florida was the epicenter of pharmaceutical companies that knew they were sending millions of pills to one pharmacy, not a word. They made billions off of the backs of Americans' lives. And so Congress is now, we're see, we are seeing the administration say they're gonna hold them accountable. It's yet to be determined. Yes? So given the current administration's um, lack of acceptance of science, Yes. What do you think would be good steps for advocates mm -hmm. to change things given the crisis that's going yeah. uh, what, what I'm seeing happen uh, with the recovery organizations that I follow is, is and the work I'm, is we're still doing our work. Mm -hmm. And here's the key is what I'm seeing right here in Washington State. It's, oh my gosh, I get chills. We have a, an attorney, brand new attorney, who was formerly in prison. And he went to the Supreme Court of his home state where he went to law school and, and he was able to get the, 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 he's an attorney, but he's moved here now and he's in charge of Washington State Corrections reentry systems. That's what I'm seeing happen, is people who have walked the path, been through the system and gone, no, this needs to change. And governors of states going, yeah, come aboard. So. Uh, I, what I'm seeing happen is the advocacy work still happening, but it is very difficult. With and, and I'll just say it, um, the president. I was excited when he got on national TV and he said we have a crisis, but no funding. And this is what you guys will struggle with in your work: is people can talk all they want, but if the dollars don't follow, it means nothing. And that's where we're at. So we're still waiting. Yes. So is there a way to pitch the argument? Because he ran on jobs, ran on yeah. helping people, so and we'll have midterm elections coming up soon. That you can take pieces from this and say, if you want to keep people in office, you have to put money behind your. Well, office. we're waiting for the midterm elections. Yeah, yeah, but you have to do the work now. Oh, yeah, we, yeah, oh yeah, it's yeah, happening. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Okay. Great questions. Got a couple minutes. I'm I'm an open book. Um, I want to close with this. Um, we are a family in recovery. Uh, I uh, am a person in recovery because of access to treatment, resources. Um, I haven't had to use a drug, uh, take a drink of alcohol since March 25th of 2007. 
My wife is a person in long-term recovery. She is a person in recovery that had access to treatment at a very young age. She's been in recovery longer than me. My son, who, <laughs> I didn't plan on this, um, but this is an emotional thing, it's a family thing. He's a person in long-term recovery. He just celebrated four years. And I can tell you, and my best friend who's sitting in the back room today, um, I remember it was ugly. I was scared. But because of access to treatment, family support, and understanding, and long-term recovery support, he's a person in recovery. His wife is a person in long-term recovery. Recovery works. Lives change. Don't believe everything you've been told about substance use disorders. And that's the last thing I'll close on is the language, just the language that has historically been used to describe me, a human, has been atrocious. And that's what this film that talks about in there is even shifting the language that's used. Thank you for letting me be here. Enjoy the rest of the day.